Well, good morning, church. It is, uh, it is a great morning to be here, and uh, I don't know about you, but I was, I was blessed by that testimony that Lawrence brought. He, God is good, is he not? He is so good. Good morning. I am Greg Alquist, and I'm an elder here in the church, um, and it is, uh, it is a gift to me uh, to be able to share just a word with you today. So I'm a teacher by trade, and so I was in the midst of a leadership project, and, uh, and this, was, this was several years ago, and, and in the midst of it, it wasn't going exactly as we had hoped, and there was a lot of frustration in the room, and then it was, it was kind of a, immediately right after that project, when we were kind of doing an autopsy on it, that somebody said this kind of big business saying that probably many of you have heard, and they said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And boy, was that convicting in the moment, that, that the system was perfectly designed to get that frustrating point that they had reached. But here is what I want to proclaim this morning. The kingdom does not function that way. The kingdom is advancing, it's moving, and it takes wherever we are and wherever we find ourselves right now in that, in that, in that situation that you named and the Lord might have brought to mind when Lawrence was praying this morning, and he steps into that situation and the kingdom moves because the kingdom is about change and it offers something different and ultimately something greater, and something better, and something more. And we're in the midst of a series about how it does keep getting better, that there's something always better. There's always a next, and with God, there's always a better. And the kingdom keeps advancing, and it steps into the midst of where we find ourselves. But here's what I have found. Number one is that, that the kingdom moves forward, but it often comes as an invitation that demands a response. God isn't going to force his way in but he opens it with an invitation. And secondly, when we have that invitation in front of us, frequently it seems like we're choosing something less than, and that the options don't seem as good on the surface, and it seems like we are moving against the culture. And that's often the way that the kingdom works. Stepping into something new requires strength and perseverance, and oftentimes it's difficult and it's uncomfortable, but ultimately it's better. And what I have found in the kingdom is that it often works together. It demands us walking together side by side. It's like apprenticeship, and Jesus often refers to it as discipleship in the New Testament. And the kingdom functions under apprenticeship. And so what I want to do today is look at two passages, one in the Old Testament and then one in the New Testament, and kind of see how this kingdom moves forward in the context of apprenticeship. Pull out some principles, and ultimately, ultimately, we're going to land on Jesus and ultimately the invitation that he offers to us to apprentice under him. But the first passage I want to look at has to do with Elijah and Elisha. So let me start in 1 Kings 19. It says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12 pair. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. He took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and he gave it to the people and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. You see, Elijah walks up to him, and when he, when he, when that part of the passage, when it said he threw his cloak around, that is kind of an invitation to Elisha to come underneath, to come alongside, to apprentice with him. And so Elisha has a choice, but it's perhaps a little bit more of a complicated choice than it might first appear on the surface, because if you notice the details, he's out plowing in the field and he's got 12 yoke of oxen. That's a lot of oxen. And what that actually tells us is he's rich. He's plowing one, but he's got 11 that keep going even as he's sitting there talking to Elijah. And he has to, have, he has to make a choice. 
Is he gonna give up what he has? Is he gonna give up the possibility and the option of more to follow an apprentice? And the first principle that we have is that walking away from more can often be difficult. It's the desire for more that can often hold us back. And when the desire for more and the accumulation of other things begins to drive our decisions, we often miss what else God might have in front and for us. But he ultimately follows him. And not only does he follow him, he actually burns and gives up everything to be able to do it. And there was a cost to that. And I don't want to move too quickly past that. Because deciding to apprentice and hoping for something greater sometimes desire requires us to walk away from more, to step in to something better. But there's something more that I want to unpack. You see, it's great for Elisha, and he has to step away from the more. But there's something else for Elijah that is, uh, that is, that is part of this story. Elisha's yes is not just for him and what's going to happen over the next several years of his life, but there's also a story about Elijah hidden underneath it. The arc of Elijah's, of Elijah's story begins just a little bit earlier in that chapter. You see, it read right up at the top, Elijah had just gotten off kind of this big showdown with Baal and kind of won this fantastic moment. And then there's a hit that's put out on his life by Jezebel. And when he hears about that hit, everything in Elijah's life starts crumbling down. And this is what the passage actually says. It says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. How many of us find ourselves running from something? And he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. And I think we need to take Elijah's pain very seriously. It's a cry that he's ready to give up. He's ready to die. But he's honest with the Lord about how he feels. And he takes it to him. And what unfolds is just the kindness of the Lord. The angel of the Lord shows up, actually ministers to him gives him something to eat, tells him to get a good night's sleep, which are two really good pieces of advice, by the way. And then Elijah experiences and has an encounter with the Lord. And God shows up and he hears God and he's got this miraculous encounter with the Lord. But the final arc to the story of going from wanting to die and praying that he's going to be able to die is that God tells him to go find Elisha. You see, the apprenticeship that he offers Elisha into, I believe, is the culmination of God's answer to prayer for Elijah's despair. That apprenticeship, mentorship, Discipleship, it holds so much for both. And Elisha's yes meant an incredible thing for his life, but it also meant something powerful for Elijah's. And that's the invitation that the Lord holds before us. But that more the desire for more can sometimes stand in the way. But I want to pick up one other piece from that passage. When Elisha said yes, 
The verse is short, right at the end. And he says, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. He made the decision to serve him. And the decision to serve somebody else can also be difficult. Because in some ways, in so many ways, it's easier to serve ourselves. It's easier when it's all about me and myself and my preferences, my desires and my time and my money and my life, then I get to choose what it is. And autonomy is often what we value. But what service does is it pulls us out of that gravitational pull of selfishness and moves us to a different place to see others and to teach us something powerful. You see, what this ultimately means for Elisha is that he has to yield his will to somebody else. And that opens the possibility of learning incredible things that he never would have learned if he stayed within the gravitational pull of selfishness. And for about 18 years, different people debate how long he actually served. Some say it was as, less, as, as, as few as nine. Some say it might be as many as 23. But Elisha served under Elijah. And think about what they must have learned and what they must have talked through. Elisha had this opportunity to learn about how Elijah stood up to some of the biggest, greatest powers of his day. But I also suspect that Elijah walked him through the valley of the shadow of death that he had faced. And perhaps he even talked about how Elisha was part of the answer to that valley, that he now had somebody to walk through it with him. And that is what life in the kingdom is about. It doesn't mean that you're gonna avoid, it means that you go through and you have somebody alongside with you. And serving may not be easy, but I think there's something spiritual that is, that is released. There's something supernatural that comes when we make the decision to serve someone else. If beginnings are hard, and in, in, in fact, this is the story of Elisha's life right at the beginning, and while that may be difficult and challenging, in some ways, endings perhaps are even more so. And why is that? Why are beginnings and endings hard, by the way? I think it's because both involve change. And they move us outside of our comfort zone. And so I wanna fast forward Elijah and Elisha's story to the end and pick that story up because Elisha and Elijah are aware that Elijah's time on earth is coming to an end. It's super interesting as a setup to this passage too because three times Elijah says, hey, Elisha, why don't you just stay here? I gotta go on a little bit further. And you know what Elisha says? No way, I'm going with you. Three times, he's like, why don't you stay? Nope, I'm going. He's staying right beside him. And they crossed over. And Elijah said to Elisha, well, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you've asked a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. And it's super interesting to me here. The time is coming when the end is near and it's in sight. And what does Elisha ask for? A double portion. What he wants and what he sees is that he wants to see God accomplish even more. I don't think this is actually a self-centered ask. I think this is where Elisha sees the need that's in front of him, and he wants more. He wants more than just what he's, what he's been seeing up to this point. 
I don't think this is about competition, but I think this is about an engaging spirit to see the kingdom of God advance and to move forward. And ultimately at the heart of mentoring, Elisha is asking for something that is at the heart of mentoring. And that is that every mentor wants to see their apprentice go further than they were. That's what we want for our families. That's what we want. That's what I desperately want for my kids. And so I want to raise the ceiling about what I have so that my kids can go further. And so Elisha leans into that, I think because they had walked and they had talked and looked at this. This is what mentoring is, as the passage continues. It says, as they were walking along and talking together, and don't miss that, they're walking along and talking together. And that's what apprenticeship looks like. It means walking together and talking together and doing life together. And that is a challenge and an invitation for all of us. And suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Boy, that must have been awesome. And Elisha saw this and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. He's gone. And let's be very, very clear about this. It is not easy. And what does he do? Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it in two. And don't miss that line. He rips it in two. There is a profound sadness at losing his mentor. And that is the third principle, that it is incredibly difficult to lose a mentor. And this speaks to the reality of loss that all of us face. Whether it's someone or something, I think many of us have found ourselves in the, in the period and sometimes an extended period of mourning. And so what does Elisha do? He rips his cloak. And he's sad. But what it says right after that is he picks up the cloak of Elijah. He rips his own, but he picks that up and he keeps moving. And I'm just going to speculate here. I think the way that Elisha learned to navigate that agony and that pain was from the sorrow that he heard Elijah walk him through. The reason he was able to pick up that cloak and then cross back over from where he had been because he take Elijah's cloak and he hits the water and then he goes back over from where he had been. I think part of the reason that he's able to do that is because they had walked together and talked together and he had stayed connected. And that is our invitation. So walking away certainly can be difficult. Walking away from more can be difficult. Serving someone else can be difficult. And losing a mentor can be difficult. But here's what the kingdom is ultimately about. The kingdom is about letting go of something, but stepping into something greater. The kingdom is about being accountable and iron sharpening iron and serving somebody else to rip me out of my gravitational selfishness. And the kingdom is ultimately about a double portion and greater things that are yet to become. Because sometimes there's only things that God can do when he rips me outside of my comfort zone and sets me into a new context. And that is the next invitation. Because I want to fast forward into into Jesus' life when God actually steps in and the kingdom is advancing and the kingdom is moving. And when we first catch a glimpse of Jesus in John's gospel... He's walking past and John the Baptist sees him, kind of calls out who he is. And his disciples kind of start walking right behind him. They're like following Jesus. And here I'm going to pick up the story in John 1. It's just turning around. Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Super interesting question, isn't it? What do you want? Why are you following me? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? That word, by the way, where are you staying, means where are you remaining? Where where are you going to continue to be? 
They want to know a little bit about his direction and what he's about. And in typical Jesus fashion, he doesn't really answer. He answers, but he doesn't answer. He says, come and see. You want to see where I'm staying? You want to see what I'm about? You want to see where I'm going to continue to be? Come along. Come and see. Reminds me of that psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And that is the way of Jesus. It is an invitation. An invitation to come, to follow, and to see just how good he is. And so they went and they saw where he was staying. And here's the next phrase. And they spent the day with him. They spent the day with him. You see, following Jesus means that I'm going to be attached to him. I'm going to spend time with him. And the front end of this invitation is to come and see. It's the same invitation that's to you and to me that stands in front of us each day. Come and see. You want to see how your, your situation and your circumstance can change? Come and see. Come and see. And it doesn't mean that you won't have to give up something to follow. And it does mean, ultimately, that we will serve him. But I think that, I think that question that the disciples ask is such a good one. Where are you staying? And in some ways, Jesus does answer it. But as I look at the rest of Scripture, throughout the rest of the Gospel of John, I actually think Jesus spends much of the rest of the Gospel of John unpacking what that means. And he gets to the end, when the end is in, in sight. So beginnings are tough. Sometimes endings are tougher. And when Jesus is getting near the end of his life, I think his, he, the cross is clearly within his sights. And so he pulls and he's, and he's teaching his disciples for one of the last time. And one of the last I am teachings, when Jesus rips through a whole bunch of them that I'm the bread of life and I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. The last I am teaching right before he is set to go to the cross. Do you know what it is? It's the, it, I think he deliberately chose it right at the end to ultimately teach and prepare them for what was to come with life without him. And he says, in chapter 15 of John, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And here, I think, is the truth for us. If you remain in me, by the way, that's the same word that the disciples ask. Where are you staying? Where are you remaining? Now Jesus is going to directly answer that question. Where does he remain? Where is he going to stay? And where has he been staying? I remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Where did Jesus remain? In his Father's love. Eleven times in that passage, Jesus says to remain. The New King James calls it abide. So abide. And here, I think, is the blueprint that Jesus provides for us in that invitation to come and see. But after he is gone, it is to remain and it is to abide. The kingdom is about letting go of something and stepping into something greater. The kingdom is about serving somebody else. It's about making myself accountable to somebody else and have an iron sharpened iron in this. And the kingdom is ultimately about greater things that are yet to come. And we accomplish that by remaining in him. And that is my challenge for us. So how do we remain? I want to get super practical here. 
There are five what we call spiritual disciplines. Another word for those disciplines are that they're practices. They're things that we can do. They're, they're, they're formational practices that we can do that ultimately are in service of remaining with Jesus. And I want to put, there's a, a whole set of different ones and different people have different lists, but let me just share, share with you five quick. The five that Jesus kind of identifies or that kind of emerge out of scripture, especially when I read it, number one is that there's silence and solitude, that there's prayer, that there's Sabbath, that there's Bible study and there's fasting. And so here's my challenge for us that as we respond to God's and Jesus's invitation to come and apprentice under and with him, pick one of those five this week. And maybe it's one that you are already familiar with. And maybe it's one that you wanna dig more deeply into. But make a decision that I'm gonna spend more time, that I wanna remain in him, that I wanna abide, that I want to sign back up for this again. That Jesus' Jesus's invitation to us is to come and see that I'm good. And so spend some time with one of these five. But can I tell you the way that I'm wired? The way that I'm wired is to do those things and to make it kind of a checklist. And when I do that, the goal is not just to do one of those things. If, 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 the, if the goal is just to accomplish this so that it's done, then I miss the mark. Each one of those practices is meant to reach a greater end, which is to know him. So if I'm doing scripture just to do scripture because that's what I'm supposed to be doing so I can check it off and mark it and so that I know it and now it's done, I think discipleship with Jesus is not knowing something like it's a test and then I'm getting feedback on. No, I think discipleship is more about love and it's about knowing somebody else and it's about a relationship. And so that's the invitation that we have. So if you are online, you get the, uh, you get the built-in advantage of those five that are going into the chat. And you can pick those five up. But let's make a decision. It may not make sense on the surface to give up more, to choose to serve, or to have to navigate through the loss of someone or something else but that it's good on the other side. And it's an invitation to know him more and to know him more deeply. Would you stand? Jesus, we, uh, we, choose, to, we choose to follow you once more. We wanna sign back up that we want to, we want to apprentice under you. And so God, would you come and would you show us, would you allow us to see just how good you are? Would you give us the courage to step into that today, to be able to step away from the things that are holding us back and that we would step into something greater, to step into something better because life with you is better. Would you do that in our lives, Jesus? Amen.